No my hari my. Good morning and welcome. And if you're here for the very first time, my name is Richard. I love riding my motorbike. I enjoy a nice latte and giving lots of cheek to my wife. It's great to be here, and it's a real privilege to bring the Word of God today. We're going to dive straight into the story of the resurrection, and we're going to pick up Matthew's version. It's beautiful. The, the story of the resurrection, not surprisingly, is in all four of the gospel according to you. By the way, you don't have four gospels. There's only one gospel, but we have four different takes on that one gospel. The gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's only one gospel, not four gospels, just to be clear. We're going to examine and look at and dive into Matthew's version of events, the very first book of the New Testament, Matthew 28. And I'm going to invite you to stand back to your feet in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Thank you very much. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, You must say, Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, he'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God bless the reading of his word. Thank you so much. Take your seat, please. I want to call this talk Because He Lives. Because He Lives. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you listening? Are you ready? <laughs> That's an amazing story. Thank you, Dana and Jervin, for reading that so well. That's right. It's an amazing story of the very first Easter morning according to Matthew. Now, let's look at Matthew. I think it's an amazing scene right there. You've got two girls, two ladies with Mary, the same name, and they, they have this dramatic encounter, right? These two earthquakes. There's an earthquake when Jesus died, and now there's an earthquake happening as he is resurrected. And the trained, highly trained, hardened Roman soldiers fall down. They're frightened with fear. 
they're comatized, they're, they're gone, they're, they're down and out. And have a chat with an angel who says, hey, come and see for yourself. Now go and tell the disciples. And they're banging to Jesus on the way. And I love verse 10 because it says, <laughs> even though the disciples had been battling doubt, discouragement, as Pastor Wee Young alluded to, they had doubts and fears and they should have known what was going to happen, but they still didn't really believe. And what did Jesus call them? If it was me, I'd give them a real grilling. Guys, I said I was going to do it. You're with me for three years. Get it together. He doesn't. He calls them brothers. Actually, the original word is brethren. It's a deep, endearing family term. Because Jesus understands. Jesus empathizes with our weakness. And guess what the priest did? Did you see what happened right there? They tried to cover it up, which is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous cover-up story. They're saying, hey, just tell everybody while the guards were asleep, the disciples stole the body. The question is, how do they know it was the disciples if they're all asleep? Have you ever thought about that? It's interesting, isn't it? It's just another foolish attempt to cover up the real problem. And isn't that what we do sometimes? The real problems often lie much deeper, but we medicate it with entertainment, with busyness, maybe drugs, alcohol, sex. We medicate it with busyness and fame and affirmation from people, whether we're living on the street, doing it tough, or we're, we're in a three-piece suit in a high-rise in Auckland City. So often we are caught up with addictions. We're trying to cover up the real issue. In fact, we see in Genesis chapter 3 a cover-up. We see right here at the resurrection of Christ a cover-up. All through the Bible, humans are trying to cover up the truth. Maybe today, you're trying to cover up something, at least in front of other humans. We mask things all the time. We medicate. We try as best we can. It's like trying to keep a beach ball under the water at the beach, right? It pops up. It keeps popping up. It's just a lot of hard work maintaining the charade. What God wants to do is get to the real problem, the real issue. Anyway, let's get back to the story. I want, you, I want to make no mistake today. The resurrection is a really massive issue because the resurrection is the single greatest event in human history. In fact, it's hard to overstate the importance of the resurrection. Why? Because the resurrection is the supreme vindication of Jesus' claim to deity. No one else has done it, ladies and gentlemen. Not Mohammed, not Confucius. None of the millions of gods of, that, that we might claim with Buddha and Hinduism. No, friend. Only Christ has risen from the dead. He is distinct, dramatically distinct from all other so-called small g gods. This is his supreme vindication, the evidence that he is who he said he is. The apostle Paul made his point bluntly. He said this in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, his predictions about himself were wrong and his claim to have power over death and sin in our lives, it's got to be doubted, right? So the focus of it all is the resurrection. Dying on a cross was not uncommon for Roman soldiers. Crucifixion was a normal thing to do. What was so, so tragic about it and so unjust is he was innocent. And once again, we have ourselves a cover-up, by the way. But he went through it having all the authority to abandon that space and moment and boom, some dramatic epic scene, but he yields to the Father's will. For well, he knows he was born to die and to live again. Paul tells the people in Corinth, he continues in chapter 15, he says, I passed on to you what was most important 
of what has also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. You see, the importance of the resurrection can't be overstated. So consequently, there are other theories. You would think 2,000 years later, right, if they could just discredit that one moment of the resurrection of Christ, it's all over and we are a pack of fools. Can I tell you, the Christian church globally is growing at a great rate of knots. Millions of people across all the continents believe in the risen Savior. Not just mental ascent, not just a theological concept, but a true transforming life. There are theories, and here are the top three theories that have been offered in place of the Christian history of the resurrection. The first one is mass hallucinations. Like the resurrection was, was a case of mass hallucinations among Jesus' followers. In other words, Jesus didn't really, it wasn't really alive, it was just imaginary. Now, at first glance, there's just a couple of problems with that. If that's true, then that had to apply across numerous individuals under various circumstances and different locations, both indoors and outdoors, not just on one particular day, but over a period of weeks to people of different backgrounds and personality types. They all had to do it kind of in this mass condition. Very unlikely, wouldn't you think? Also, it begs the question, why didn't the Jewish leaders and Roman guards simply go to the tomb and produce the body? That would have dealt with that theory. Let's move on to one of the more popular ones, the swoon theory. The swoon theory, that Jesus didn't really die, he just fainted. The problem is this. How could Jesus who was unbelievably beaten to a pulp and abused so they couldn't even recognize him, be in a coma for three days, have the strength to remove a, ma- remove a massive stone, defeat a squad of highly trained Roman soldiers, and walk the earth for 40 days and then fake his ascension. I think you find the plausibility does not sit under that theory. Then we have the conspiracy, the myth theory, the idea that the disciples made up the resurrection story and stole his body. The problem with that is this could have it be immediately been disproved by the Jews and the Romans by simply going to the tomb. Also, if it is a myth or a conspiracy, it is unlikely the disciples would have stuck to the story through their horrendous torture and death. Most of us buckle under a snotty nose and a bad weather. They stuck to it and went through the agony of death. All, I think, but John the Apostle was tortured and martyred. Even our man Peter, who buckled under pressure before he became the man of God he is. So we have these theories, these competing theories around the resurrection, and none of them carry water after 2,000 years of academics, atheist academics, and so forth, still don't have credibility. And in contrast to that, there is overwhelming evidence for the resurrection. I love the book called A Case for Christ by former atheist and legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, a guy called Lee Strobel. Some of you may have heard of him. It's a great read in his book. He lists the medical evidence for the resurrection, the evidence of the missing body, the evidence of appearances after his death, and the circumstantial evidence that support the facts of his resurrection. Furthermore, here's a couple of other interesting supporting facts for the Christian view of the resurrection. The New Testament writers like Mark began writing about the resurrection within a few years of his death while others who could have either refuted it or supported it were still living. Eyewitnesses were there. And they did not because they knew it, they knew it was true. Furthermore, The Jews never disputed the empty tomb. They only promoted theories as to why it was empty. 
The evidence is overwhelming. We could do a five-part seminar in the next couple of weeks to present all the evidence as to the resurrection. It's overwhelming. The writer of Corinthians tells us that there are hundreds of eyewitnesses just in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 7. He says, he was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some now have died. Then he was seen by James and later by the apostles. There's written evidence, people, hundreds of people who saw the risen Christ, who saw the dead man on the cross. There is not one shred of evidence in all of human history that one, any person has ever survived a Roman crucifixion, not one. Jesus went all the way, fulfilling every word that he had committed. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you today that there is only one valid and true explanation, that all the facts and the evidence tell us one thing, that Jesus rose from the dead. Can everyone, anyone say, if you believe it, say amen. amen. Praise God. If you don't believe it, no problem. We'll talk about it more later. I'll get you to read that book and we'll talk after that. The evidence, the testimony has stood firm for 2,000 years. Jesus was seen alive, as mentioned before. He was alive, then he's dead, then he's alive again by over 500 people over a period of about a month. Because he lives, countless lives have been seen, have ever since, sorry, have been powerfully transformed, saved, delivered. People like Karina, this room is filled with people whose lives have been transformed because Jesus did overcome the power of sin and death. Because he lives, my life is so radically different. You wouldn't recognize me. One day we're going to have to run a video. I tell you what, I would never darken the door of a church. A wild, rebellious Kiwi young man looking to cause trouble. Trouble didn't have to find me. I'd create the trouble. I tell you what, it's true. Caught up in all sorts of Sin cycles. Until March 1993, after trying to cover things up for years. You know you can be in church and still have another life. You do know that, right? I, I know what it's like to slip in. I know what it's like to serve on the stage and fake the funk. Just because you got a little bit of talent on the drum kit got me in there and I was just doing my thing, doing my time for God, but really some uncontrollable patterns in my life that, frankly, I enjoyed. Till March 1993, in fact, about three years prior to that, I just knew it wasn't working. I knew something had to change. I was trying to put God in my box, make Him my God. I hadn't heard about this thing called lordship and surrender and repentance. I just trying to make him my, my little like Santa Claus when I felt a bit down. ka go to church, get a little top up. But really, the pornography and all the other things that go along with it were the master. Friend, I can tell you honestly today, I'm a different man because Jesus rose from the grave. It's real. I believe it. And just after the resurrection, after those 500 or plus people, Jesus appeared. Can I invite the band to come up, please, and join me? Jesus appeared to a couple of disciples who were walking along the road of Emmaus. And he began to explain to them from Moses and all the prophets, how every story in the Old Testament had been about him. And he was trying to give these, these two guys confidence that he really was who he, he said he was. I mean, you might think the resurrection itself was enough proof, but evidently Jesus believed 
that it would be even more convincing to show these two guys on the road to Emmaus that every single page of a book written by over 30 different authors over the space of 1,500 years had consistently told one story, and it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. Now, I don't know exactly what went down in that conversation, but I imagine it would have sounded something like this. In Genesis, I was the word of God, created, creating the heavens and the earth. In Exodus, I was a Passover lamb whose blood was sprinkled on the doorpost of your heart so that you could escape the bonds of slavery. In Leviticus, I was a temple, the holy place where you met with God. In Numbers, I was your ever-present God, your pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, I was a prophet coming who was greater than Moses. In Joshua, I am the conquering warrior leading you into a promised land. In Judges, I am the conquering, sorry, in Judges, I was a broken savior, risen up, rising up to rescue you. In Ruth, I was a kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, I was a pure-hearted king, shepherd king who rushed out to face your giants all alone. In First and Second Kings, I was a righteous ruler. In First and Second Chronicles, I was a restorer of the kingdom. Is anybody listening? In Ezra, the faithful scribe, and Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the walls. In Esther, I am your advocate, rising, risking my life to store you to royalty. In Job, I was your living redeemer. In Psalms, I was the one who hears your cries. In Proverbs, I am wisdom personified. In Ecclesiastes, I am the meaning that lets you escape the madness. In Songs of Solomon, I am your lover and your bridegroom. In First and Second Kings, I am the righteous ruler. In First and Second Chronicles, I was the restorer of the kingdom. We're going to keep going, people. In Ezra, the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the walls. In Esther, hallelujah. I've already, in Esther, sorry. I was your advocate, risking my life to restore you to royalty. In Job, I was your living redeemer. In Psalms, I was the one who hears your cries. Proverbs, I am wisdom personified. I mentioned in Ecclesiastes, I'm the meaning of it all. I think I've repeated myself. We're going to jump to 1 Jeremiah. I am the spirit that writes God's laws on your heart. Hallelujah. In Lamentations, I was the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, I was the river of life bringing healing to the nations. In Daniel, I was a fourth man in the fire. In Hosea, I was the ever faithful Husband pursuing my faithful, unfaithful bride. In Joel, I was a restorer of all that the locusts have eaten. In Amos, I was your burden bearer. In Obadiah, the judge of all the earth. In Jonah, the prophet cast into the storm so that you could be brought in. In Micah, the everlasting ruler born to us in Bethlehem. In Nahum, the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, your reason to rejoice even when your fields are empty. In Zephaniah, I am the great reformer. In Haggai, the cleansing fountain. In Zechariah, the pierced son, whom every eye on earth will one day behold. In Malachi, I am the son of righteousness rising with healing in my wings. And the Bible doesn't stop there. He promised he would come and he came. Praise Jesus. If you believe it, why don't you stand to your feet? Stand to your feet. In Matthew, stand to your feet. There we go. Matthew, he's the king of the Jews. In Mark, he's the son of God. And Luke, he's the savior born to us in the city of David, Christ the Lord. In John, he's the word becoming flesh, dwelling among us. In Acts, he is Christ, the risen Lord, proclaiming salvation to the nations. In Romans, he's a justifier. First and second Corinthians, the spirit at work in the churches. In Galatia, he's the righteousness imputed to all by faith. In Ephesians, our righteous armor. In Philippians, the God who meets every need. In Colossians, the firstborn of all creation. In first and second Thessalonians, he descended from heaven with a shout coming to meet us together in the clouds in First and Second Timothy, the one mediator become between man and God. In Titus, our faithful pastor. In Philemon, our redeemer restoring us to service. In Hebrews, our great high priest. In James, a life of work and our faith. First and Second Peter, our living cornerstone. First, second and third John, our advocate pleading his righteousness in our place. In Jude, he's God our Savior, the one who keeps us from stumbling and presents us blameless in his presence and with great joy. In Revelations, ladies and gentlemen, we have made it. In Revelations, he's the Alpha and the Omega. 
the beginning and the end. The Lamb slain before the foundations of the world. The King of kings. The Lord of lords. He's always only ever been about Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And Paul says in Colossians, Christ is a visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anyone. Anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For though Him, through Him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through Him and for Him. He existed before anything else, and He holds all creation together. Christ alone is the head of the church, which is your body. He is the beginning, the supreme over all who rise from the dead. So He is first in everything. Jesus is the center of all. If you believe it, let's begin to sing and declare that He lives.